starting the day. And I'll ask you today, um, have you ever found it difficult um, to be a follower of Jesus? Have you ever found that difficult? It's not a trick question, it's just an honest one, right? One that, one that I felt um, plenty of times in the middle of the trials and hardships of life, all of us can struggle to hold on to hope or hold on to purpose or hold on to joy. And if you're like me, sometimes life can get a little chaotic or overwhelming or painful or maybe just sometimes so freaking distracting, right, that when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, it isn't just difficult. Sometimes I throw my hands up and go, I don't even know if I know how to do this, right? I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Um, but, but maybe you can relate to some of that. And if so, I think we're both going to learn something in this new series that we're calling Grace and Grit. Because it was from a first century Roman prison cell that the Apostle Paul, unsure if he was going to be set free or if he was going to be publicly executed, um, he writes with a deep sense of inseparable conviction and joy at the same time in the middle of prison, speaking with conviction and with joy about living as a Christ follower in the middle of trial, in the middle of hardship, in the middle of uncertainty, with a whole lot of grace and a little bit of grace. So we're going to jump into it. We're in the New Testament um, letter of Philippians. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, you can turn there with me. They're also going to have it on the screen behind me. Paul writes Philippians, like I said, from a prison cell in Rome, which I find um, partly ironic because um, when he was in Philippi last, he and another guy named Silas were actually arrested and thrown in prison. And this is kind of a regular thing for him, it turns out. So, like, as he's in that prison cell, I imagine him being maybe a little sentimental and being like, oh, this reminds me of the last time I was in Philippi. I'm going to write to those guys. And when he was in prison for a disturbance that he caused in the city as he was sharing the gospel, uh, and people began to follow Jesus. If you're interested to read about it, it's in Acts chapter number 16. Um, and and I, I think I'd like to take a second, though, right out of the gate to clear up maybe some misconceptions when we think about um, maybe the type of people um, Jesus and his disciples and even the type of person Paul was. Because uh, a lot of times we have pictures. I think even our series graphic has like an old, like, grizzly guy, like, writing on something. Right? We have all these um, ideas of what these people might look like. Misconceptions. I want to I wanna make it really clear. Like, these guys were outlaws. Like, Paul was, like, in jail a lot. Jesus um, spent a lot of his time um, dodging the authorities. But a lot of times you see pictures of Jesus and he's this guy with, like, milky skin and, like, straight hair that was used a flat iron that morning. You know, that's what, that's what he did. He had nice, rosy cheeks. Like, that wasn't Jesus. That's not, that's not Jesus at all. Jesus um, like I said, he spent his ministry dodging arrest, defending the poor and the powerless, befriending the rejected, protecting prostitutes and other notorious sinners, the scripture calls them. And, and, and even the idea of him being a carpenter, that, that word carpenter we use a lot of times to describe um, he and even his father Joseph's um, vocation, the job that they have. But, but that word carpenter, that idea that's there in Scripture, it's more the idea of builder um, or even like stonemason. So, so the idea that some people have in their heads of Jesus as this carpenter, you know, that would like whittle or keep like, you know, uh, care for your baby or like uh, some bowls or cups or something like that. that. That's not what Jesus did. It was a lot more likely um, that he was a builder and he handled big, heavy stones and would carry heavy stones. I'm saying he was a strong, rough-handed man, not a milky-skinned, like, straightened hair kind of guy. Um, he would have stood out, is what I'm saying. He would have stood out among the other rabbis of his time. Like, he didn't see fancy, educated students of the law as his followers. He chose working men. He chose fishermen, tax collectors, rebels, fighters, unqualified men from unknown families. Right? That they would have looked very different than a lot of other students following around their fancy dress rabbi. Right? And most churches would be hesitant to even let them in, or if they walked in, like they'd be like, hey, come on, I volunteer, keep an eye on these guys as they walk make sure they don't cause any trouble. Right? And, and Paul started off the polar opposite. He was educated and respected. He was from a good family. He was zealous. He was perfectly behaved. He was articulate. 
it was probably more manicured and, and, and better dressed and probably better looking than the other guys. But, but then he met Jesus, and that totally turned around for him. So if you were hoping following Jesus would make you like better looking and all these other things, that's not exactly how it happened in the first century. He met Jesus in his whole life. Paul ended up enduring brutal beatings and stonings and shipwrecks and multiple imprisonments, right? Because of his faith in Jesus, faith that he shared and that he said in Galatians, remember our series in Galatians, he says, I bear in my body the mark to prove that I belong to Jesus. I, I'm saying that these men, when, when we're talking about Paul, when we're talking about Jesus and his disciples, they're not harmless, perfect, soft boys that they're portrayed as so often. And it was from a cold, dingy prison cell that Paul writes this letter in Philippians 1, verse 1. We're going to start reading. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Now, I told you before, Paul and Silas. But, like, if you hung out with Paul, you went to jail sometimes. That's basically what happens. So he said, Paul, so be careful if you want to hang out with me sometimes. So it's Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Remember, he's in prison. So the next word he says is, help! For me, right? That's what, that's what he says. No, no, that's, that, that's not what he says at all. That's not his mindset. He doesn't view himself as a victim. Right? And that's something that I think is pretty prevalent in our culture. There's a lot of people who like to paint themselves into a, a victim role and say, look at me. And it's because the culture that we have is so, like, um, law-based, right? It's justice-based. So, so you're either a perpetrator or a victim. Like, that's how culture shapes everything. That's not how Paul thought of, thought of himself here. He used the really radical word in verse number two. He said, this is his reading, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This is the foundational belief that this entire letter is written on. This statement right here, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion. That God finishes what he starts, period. God always finishes what he starts. If he started something in you, come hell or high water, he will finish it. We're going to see in this story that even a jail cell or a death sentence cannot stop what God wants to do in you and through you. And maybe if you're like me, that's where um, this whole thing, kind of the wheels start to fall off a little bit, right? You're like, well, I, I really struggle sometimes. I, I, have, I have pain and doubt. I have a lot of stuff going on in my life. And that's really nice to say, but sometimes the wheels kind of fall off. I, I mean, to imagine the grit it takes to have this type of confidence sitting in a prison cell. I was doing this study uh, in our house church, and I told the guys, I was like, man, if I was the Apostle Paul, I would think I'm stuck as an Apostle. I was the worst one. All I do is I get beat up and I get thrown in jail over and over and over again. I must be bad at being an Apostle, right? And, and maybe you identify with that. Um, I have that feeling a lot of times. Like, like, man, I feel like the wheels are coming off. What, what is following Jesus all about? Maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe you've had something go on in your life and it feels like there's a death sentence pronounced over you. I know. Where people say your future is dead, your family is finished, your dreams are shattered, your reputation is ruined, and the load of shame and guilt that sits on our shoulders, it can feel so heavy that it feels like that. It feels like this is it, it's over. And maybe for you, it feels like prison sometimes. Have you ever said this phrase, like, how long am I going to have to feel this way? How long before I get a break, guys? Are you going to give me a break sometimes? When is that going to happen? How long before I see progress? How much work is this going to take? Will this situation ever change? Maybe it's this. I, I, I know I screwed up, but am I going to have to stay stuck in this hell of a prison until I die? Is this it? 
but I understand, I, I want you to hear this, I understand the deep pain and despair that comes from hardships and trials of life. And then I understand the tendency to try to pretend like everything is okay when you come to church, right? So that's the tendency is I have to pretend like everything is fine, everything is okay, I have to pull it all together and act like everything is great. And it feels like it's only you that's in prison. It feels like it's only you with the death sentence. And, and that can feel it's just gross when you're sitting in a church service and everybody's smiling, like their life is going together, and you're like, mine is not. My, my life is terrible. I don't, I don't know how to get out of this situation that I'm in. And, and I, I wonder if that might be the reason why so many of my generation kind of walked out of the church and never bothered to come back, not interested. Because it's too safe. It seems like it's not real. Right? I want you to watch this. What produced in Paul that great driven gratitude and joy in the middle of trial and hardship was not his confidence that he was going to finish what he set out to do. That's not what produced the gratitude and grace-filled joy um, that was in Paul. It wasn't that he had the confidence that he was going to figure out how to finish what he started. It's that God was. Not that he had within him the strength of will or the ability to bring the plan about, but it was great fueled grit that we're going to see again and again and again in this series, that God finishes what he starts. And if he started something good in you, you can't out God's purposes for your life. You can't out God's grace. You can't out-fail God's grace for your life. When God, when God calls you his, you're his, and it's not finished until he says that it's finished. What that confidence, not in yourself, but in God produces in you is that grace driven gratitude and joy no matter the circumstances. And, and I hear myself talk sometimes, you, you might relate to this, I hear myself talk sometimes, and, I'm, and I can think like, Brian, are you grateful for anything? <laughs> Like, do you have gratitude for anything? Or do you have joy at all? That I hear myself talk, and that's what it sounds like again. And I just want to quit and say, like, what is all this for, anyway? If, 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 I, if I'm not going to be grateful, if these things keep on happening to me, if these things keep stealing my joy, what is all this for? Right? But, but on a brief occasion, when I can be reminded that it's not my effort, that, that it's not my effort that's going to get me through, it's grace. Fueled grit that he's not giving up on me and I'm not going to either. There is no jail sentence. There is no prison sentence. There is no death sentence that can stop God from finishing what he started in you. Verse number seven. He says, It's right for me to feel this way about all of you. Um, I think he says that because sometimes if you're like me, you're like, I don't know if he's right about you. <laughs> he goes, no, it's right for me to feel this way about you. Since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. Because God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Look at those phrases. He says, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how long, um, how I long for all of you with the affections of Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying is this journey is not to be done alone. If you do not get to the finish line by yourself on this journey, listen, you are as alone as you want to be. I, I know that's hard to hear when you feel alone. When you're feeling alone, you're like, well, no one wants me, no one likes me. I'm just going to tell you, like, this might be some hard medicine. You are as alone as you choose to be. It, it, it is scary. It is a scary thing to allow other people to see you. You can watch. But why is that so terrifying? It's because our experience tells us that we're going to be judged, right? We're going to be judged, and we're not going to measure up. For, for a lot of people, church is like the least safe place to be seen, right? Like, this is the least safe environment. 
for me to be seen, for me to have relationship and connection. This is the least place, the least place. I, I can tell you this, like for me, my experience has been um, pastors, like people who lead in ministry, they're the least safe group for me to have friends with. Like, like that's the least safe group of people to be with, right? But because you better not, you, you better not mess up, right? You, you, you better not open up to someone. You better not let someone know that you're struggling. You better not let anybody know that you sin. But, but, and if we feel this way sometimes, how in the world did the early church get past this? How in the world did they navigate through this? If we feel this way in this culture that's kind of like Christianese, right? Where like everybody goes to church, everybody's grandma's a pastor, right? Especially in Pensacola, there's churches on every corner. If we feel this way, how in the world did the early church get past this? How does a guy like Saul of Tarsus, who persecuted and murdered Christians, how does he outrun his reputation? How do you, or anyone for that matter, ever receive acceptance or connection or relationship from church people? Right? Well, first of all, like, I don't know if you do from church people, but I don't know if that really happens. But followers of Jesus can say the same way Paul did. And it's what he says in verse number seven. By sharing in God's grace with me. He looks at this group, he's writing to this group of people, and he goes, you all have shared in God's grace with me. How do I find a safe place to not be alone on this journey? You share God's grace. You have that kind of deal. You extend the affection of Christ Jesus. But I am serious when I say the only chance that I have, the only chance that you have to not be alone in this is to share in God's grace with others. Like, hear, hear, hear me when I say this. You don't have to perform to be on the journey with me. Like, like you, you don't have to be perfect. You, you, you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to have the, the best language, right? Don't tell me to do, do that for a second. Like, you don't have to be all cleaned up. You don't have to be perfect to be on the journey with me. You don't have to impress me. I, I told someone the other day, a friend of mine, I said, I am just now learning the enormous difference between actually sharing grace and patience and acceptance rather than just being like the tattooed, non pious, like skinny jean pastor who touches every now and then. Right? Like, there's a huge difference in between extending grace and extending patience and extending acceptance. To broken people and not just being like the cool guy to be like, oh no, you can hang out with me, like I'm a pastor, right? Like I always get that anyway when people and I'm like, oh, I'm a pastor. They're like, you pastor, right? And I'm like, no, but okay. There's some young people there, I guess. That's what I hear all the time. Like, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to impress me. Like, there's, a, there's a huge difference in extending grace to each other. Than, than just trying to be messy, right? Like, lots of people are messy, but they don't tolerate um, someone else's mess. There's a quote from C.S. Lewis that I read this week that I thought went perfectly um, with this point and what Paul is saying. He says, To be Christian means to forgive the inexcusable, because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. I think I have it up on the screen. Jesus, to be Christian means to forgive the inexcusable, because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. This is sharing God's grace. This is the affection of Christ Jesus we should long to share with one another. And then, and then Paul says this in verse number nine. He says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So, so I'm going to agree with Paul and say that this is my prayer for me, and this is also my prayer for you, but I, but I want you to pay attention to the words that he uses. Right? Because so many Christians, so many churches, when they think about knowledge and they think about insight, they think it comes from fancy vocabulary, right? Or, or like deep, thick doctrinal studies. 
And I don't think that there's anything wrong with like trying to understand like doctrine, like, like what, what do we believe as Christians? I think that's good to do. I don't think there's anything wrong with having like fancy, like articulate theological language, but that's not where knowledge and insight comes from, or at least that's not what Paul thought. That's where knowledge and insight comes from. Right? Knowledge and insight come from a deep, deep love. That's what he says in verse number nine. And he says, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Right? And, and then I hear people say this all the time. Like, I, I don't know the right thing for me to do in this situation. Like, hey, I'm really struggling knowing what the correct thing for me to do is here. And, and I get that. Like, I, I feel this way. I, I feel trapped sometimes, like, by not knowing what the right decision is. It, it can be paralyzing when you're in a circumstance, when you're in a situation. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's, like, your future, a big decision. Maybe it's, like, your kids are going crazy, whatever it is. And you're like, I just don't know what the right thing to do is. Right? But, because I don't want to mess up. But, but because I don't want to make the wrong choice. Like, like it talks here, like, I, I would love to be pure and blameless, like he says. What I need isn't like this, is this uh, let me read a bunch, let me, let me do all this study, and I'm not saying like they're studying bad or anything like that, but to simplify it, so you understand, like sometimes you mix the forest for the tree. What you need is love. You need abundant love. A question that you should ask yourself a lot of times isn't like, man, what's the right thing for me to do? It's probably this. What does love require of me in this situation? I get so focused on like, man, what should I do? How should I? What does love require of me in this situation? I, I want to be filled with the fruit of righteousness, like we talked about. But that's a good thing, to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. But it doesn't come through my performance. It doesn't say... Right here in verse number 10, it says, So you might be able to discern what is best and pure and blameless for the day of Christ, verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through your performance. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through um, perfect church attendance, that comes through um, what you fill in the blank with whatever you want. But it doesn't come through my performance. It doesn't come through what I do or what I don't do. Being pure being blameless, knowing what's best, having knowledge and insight, even love, even having love, none of those things come from inside of me. None of those things come from inside of me. They are not produced with my performance, not from my effort, not from my confidence in me, all of it, every ounce of the life that I long for, every ounce of what I hope to one day become is grace. And that's what we're going to dive into in this series. Grace fuels grit. Because listen, it takes grit to hold on to that. It takes grit to hold on to that. The entire world, our whole culture, is organized against that. It's a perform, do, act, right? Hustle, grind. And I get it. Like you, you should work hard. You should do things that provide for your family. You should work hard. That's good. But there's got to be something when it comes to my identity that isn't based on my performance, that isn't based on my hustle or my grind. Why? Because that comes and goes, man. You can have one life event, and all of a sudden, all your hustle and all your grind that your whole identity is built around, it's completely ruined. But there has to be something else that you hold on to. Culture says that there's none. That's all you get. What is wrong? What is all of that? It's so wrong. I'm not the only one. You're not the only one who is in need of grace. Everyone everywhere is in need of grace. I'm going to ask for to go ahead and come up. One night, in a cold jail cell in Philippi, I told you Paul and Silas were locked up. And it says that as they were in there, they were actually singing. That's a weird thing to do in jail. Maybe it's not. I've never been to jail. So... And it might be a totally normal thing, actually. Uh, it's not hanging on the But they're sitting there, they're singing in jail, right? And all of a sudden, there's a big earthquake, right? And, and as the earthquake ends, it turns out all the cell doors are swinging up, they're swung open, and 
everyone's chains are broken, so everyone can be set free, right? And the Roman jailer is about to kill himself in this story. You can read about it in Acts 16. He's about to kill himself because he thought he had failed. He thought that the shame and the punishment, he was so convinced that it was going to happen, that he'd received for his failure, that it was so great that the only solution was to end his life. And then, out of the darkness, Paul says, don't do that. Don't do that. We haven't gone anywhere. And the, and the jailer's reaction is he comes and he's trembling. And his reaction to him not leaving the prison cell was, What must I do to be saved? What do you ask? What must I do to be saved? And as I was reading that story this week, all I thought was, like, Brian, maybe don't be in such a rush. To get out of the jail cell. It was the fact that Paul and Silas stayed in the jail cell. You know, the door was open, even though they their things were on, they could have got out of there as fast as they could. I thought, maybe you don't be in such a hurry to get out of the jail cell. Because God gives you the grace and the grit to keep going, but also because maybe, maybe there's someone that's watching you. Watching you that means what you have. Maybe that's And so with your head bowed and eyes closed, I want to encourage you. What Paul told the jailer when he said, what must I do to do? He said, he gave him a simple answer. He said, believe. Not only to be in the because either the grace of God has the power to save you and transform your life or it doesn't. Everyone, everyone needs it. And they did it when we did it. It takes a whole lot of grace. And a little bit of grace. And I want to ask you this morning, like, what has God started in you that he wants to finish? Maybe, maybe you're not certain who started anything. I, I know this. He would love to start a relationship with you. One that's not based on your performance. One that's not based on religion. This is purely based on his love for you. The fact that he has great grace and more grace for you. He said, what do I do? I got Tell me, tell me, what must I do to have that relationship? Same thing Paul told the Jesus. Believe me. Believe that the God of the universe is his friendship, not punishment. That he wants to know you. That he loves you. That's what he wants to start in you today. If you don't have one. To some of us in the room, who are followers of Christ. The question I struggle with is, man, it can be difficult sometimes. I feel like I'm trying and trying and trying. I want to encourage you. It's not grace or grit. It's grace and grit. It's grace fueled grit. Culture says it's either grace or it's grit. One of the two. I have to choose which one I'm going to do. No. Grace and grace. Grace fueled with grace. To be a Christian is to forgive the inexcusable. To God forgive the inexcusable in me. And I want to encourage you to share that love. Let it abound more and more among us and to the people around us. So thank you for your word. Thank you for this letter that was written in the jail that made its way to us. And it teaches us to lean not on our performance, but even in the midst of trial and hardship, and that you're right here with us, extending grace and love and purpose and joy. So God, as we speak those things, I pray that you would give us clarity even in our hardship, even in our difficulty, to pursue it from only you. 
but we love you, we worship you, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. You guys stand and worship.